object role modeling. Let me, uh, let me say, um, you've got H4 uh, is assigned. H4 should look like a familiar continuation of H2 and H1. Um, I'm giving you a data model or a, a database uh, model. And I'm saying, first of all, cast it in ORM using the tool Norma. Um, and and uh, the second part is I've changed some of the semantics of the original X, A, B, C, D. And I want you to reflect those semantics in an object role model diagram. Um, and then observe what the tables look like. That's what you'll be doing. Uh, but you're not going to be thinking about tables. You're not going to be designing tables. And you may be surprised by what you see. Um, but that's part of the part of the learning experience. Okay, um, there's the system itself. You have to get Visual Studio. How many people? How many people here? And I realize this is a real subset of the class. But how many people uh, have uh, access to the uh, MSDN? They call it the Dream Spark. Okay, so you've okay. A lot of you have done that. Well, you, how many of you have loaded? Visual Studio. Oh, wow, you're three quarters of the way there then. That's great. Um, if you haven't, you will as a result of being in this class. And, and they know who's got it and who hasn't already. So it's just uh, incremental for them to, um, uh, to give you permission. And you get an email on that uh, that'll tell you where to go. And you can download. And it's a fairly hefty program, Visual Studio, but you have to do it because Norma runs as a, as a plug-in to it. Uh, it doesn't use very much of uh, Visual Studio. In fact, there's a lot of pressure to uh, decouple and become independent of Visual Studio. But they use it for the plumbing that's, that exists there. It's plumbing that helps them write the software. Um, so there's uh, tutorials. There's one that's a, a video that I put together. Uh, there's a set of slides that uh, Terry Helton put together. Uh, there's usage notes that are written. You'll have a chance to look at those. I haven't posted those yet. I want to run that through uh, the use of the latest version of the system because it's being continually updated and improved. Um, OK, so be sure to post any questions. Uh, if there's any questions, any problems you have going down that path. The H4 assignment I've got due in week 10, which is a week and a half after the end of the spring break next week. Okay. So is there any questions on past material? Any questions on what we've talked about so far? All right. We want to talk about this new way of thinking. It's not really all that new. Uh, the first paper was published by Sheer Nyson back in 1976. Um, and I had the opportunity of uh, teaching um, at, at a two-week course in Europe uh, with Sheer Nyson in 1975. And um, we actually sat down and reviewed those papers um, before he published them. So I, in a sense, got in on the ground floor for all of this. Um, and that's why it was formally called NIAM. And that, Scheer didn't add that to it, but uh, other people named it the Nyson Information Analysis Method, um, using his name. Um, it was formally called binary modeling, and indeed it was, at, at first time, it was just for binary modeling. Now you can do ternaries and, and so on in object role modeling. Um, it's also called fact-oriented modeling. That would be the more generic um, term that's used, and it's, and it's particularly used in Europe. Um, FCO is another. There's a tool out of Europe. Uh, in fact, Sheer Nyson is now, he has his own company. Uh, he's got a son involved with him in um, in furthering and giving consulting on this whole thing of NIAM. 
It grew out of a project that Shear was involved with. He worked for CDC, and it was a project, the cadaster project, they call it. And a cadaster is a chunk of land, and so this was a system to mechanize the records of land ownership for all of the Netherlands. So it's a big task, and you can imagine that, though, that that data that he was trying to mechanize was really, really complicated because most of it was handwritten in scrolls, in, in books, in churches, and uh, largely churches because that's where the records of the community were kept. Um, and it goes, went back hundreds and hundreds of years, you can imagine. Well, in that process, Shear needed a systematic way of thinking about the data. And so he came up with what ultimately was binary modeling and NIAM. And then, Sir Nyson went, he was a visiting professor in 1983 to the University of Queensland, and Terry Halpin was there um, uh, getting his PhD in logistics, uh, not logistics, logic. So Terry Halpin is formally trained in, in in logic. And you can see a lot of that would uh, manifest itself in object role modeling. But he looked at what Sheer Nyson had and said, whoa, this is something worthwhile, was his judgment. And so they hooked up together and they actually published a book in 1989 uh, on object role modeling. And they changed the name of the modeling scheme to object role modeling. Um, since then, uh, Shear was just there for a couple of years. I don't know. I don't remember exactly how many years. And then he went back. So he's he's back in Europe. Um, and Terry actually is back in Australia after having a stint. In uh, he 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 came and he he worked for Asymmetrics, which was one of the earlier um, earlier companies that was working with. Um, they called it InfoModeler at that time. And, and, he, and, and then he went back home, and then he came. His wife liked this, uh, this uh, area, uh, this country. And so they came back and uh, settled down. He gave up his tenureship at the University of Queensland and um, um, was here for a while working with Asymmetrics uh, because he's kind of the brains behind all of this uh, thinking. Um, uh, he, he, he said, uh, you know, to Sheer Nyson, you know, it's, it's time for a revision, it's time for a revised edition. And Sheer said, no, I'm going to publish my own. So Terry went ahead and did it himself. Sheer never has. Um, and we're into basically the text is what you could consider the third edition of this, even though it's called the second because the first one had a different title. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> he worked for uh, Asymmetrics, a system called InfoModeler. Then that was purchased by um, Visio, and so then he was working for Visio for a while. Um, and then, and part of the connection there was all the diagrams in his book going way back were all done in Visio, the drawing tool. And um, so Visio, and then they started developing this underlying. Um, deep modeling, if you like, uh, where, the, where you would actually store information that under, was underneath your model, okay? Um, not just draw pictures, because that's all that Visio does, is draw pictures. And that's the Visio that we have today. So he went to work, Visio bought uh, InfoModeler, and their hope was to be able to knit together the the strong graphical orientation that they had with this underlying semantics that would be captured and recorded. And they were just in that process. Uh, that only lasted about nine months, and who would step in but Microsoft, and Microsoft bought Visio. And so Terry Halpin find him, found himself for the next couple of years working for Microsoft. Um, a, a fairly frustrating experience, I guess, would be fair to say. Because uh, they're certainly marketing driven, and Terry is a perfectionist. He wants to do it right. Um, so anyway, he left, started Newmont, and in that process, that became a Visio Enterprise Edition, which is available in Visual Studio, 
Team editions, that is the old version of all of this. Um, they were going, Microsoft was going and to this day still has not gone anywhere with that product that they produced. They, there's no training, there's no certification associated with their version of object role modeling tool in Visio. Um, so Terry went off and said, we're going to do it again. And they did at Newmont, and they called it, the, they called it Norma, the Newmont, and now they're, they're just saying natural because it's no longer associated with Newmont University. Um, natural object role modeling architect, or Norma. And what was really interesting about that is that Terry's wife's name is Norma. <laughs> so she had a big, big play in this. Okay, uh, that's enough about the history. A little bit of that is included at the front of the um, the usage notes that you'll get, a little bit of the genesis of Norma. Um, common confusion is, oh, we call it object role modeling, so it must have something to do with object-oriented whatever, whatever. And it doesn't. There's absolutely no connection between object role modeling and object orientation which is basically, basically came out of a programming discipline. So object orientation is process centric and UML consequently is process centric. It's not, its first goal is not data modeling. It's modeling processes. Um, and it's still very much clustered the attributes. You think of an object and you think of all these attributes that describe the object and there can be some structure to the organization of all of those attributes. Um, that's what's in object orientation. The key in object orientation is encapsulation. It is putting underneath a cover, if you like, and this is having, writing your programs with the discipline of the data and, or the, the data and the methods for processing the data being underneath an umbrella that you're not supposed to penetrate. You just talk to objects. You send messages between objects. Uh, and in a pure object-oriented world, everything is an object, including the people that are outside of the system, uh, uh, interacting with the system, so invoking procedures or whatever. Okay. Um, there is only one pure object-oriented programming language out there. It's called Smalltalk. Everything else is a hybrid. So the Java, the C++, the C Sharp, these are all variants. Okay, enough. That's not the subject of this class. Um, so my purpose here now is to transition your understanding. And in a way, that's what I've been doing all along. Uh, thinking about from ER modeling to an understanding and appreciation of object role modeling. All right. So, the essential difference. In entity relationship modeling, we've always talked about there being three constructs. There's entities, and there's attributes, and there's relationships. And we've t set, talked a lot about this. We say, what is an attribute? Well, an attribute is really another entity which plays a role in a relationship with an entity, some other entity. So we have the three main constructs. In ORM, we have two main constructs. We have attributes and entities. We don't try to distinguish those two. We just think of things that are out there. And then, of course, we still have relationships. The question is, what do we call this common thing? Okay. Uh, do we want to call it an entity? Well, that's got the baggage of entity relationship modeling. Do we call it an object? Well, that has the baggage of object orientation, at least that association. First paper in, in, in uh, ORM, basically, was written in 76, I said. And the first paper that talked about object, ori uh, object orientation was published in 1967, even earlier. Could call it a domain, but that's got its baggage too. <laughs> Interestingly enough, uh, one of my teaching assistants who was majoring some years back, majoring in uh, library science, he came across a paper that was published in the Indian Journal of Library Science 
dated 1939. 1939. And the essence of that paper was describing this difficulty of distinguish when something's an attribute and when it's an entity. And so they introduced the word attribute, believe it or not. <laughs> Maybe that's what we should call it. But we haven't, we've zeroed on an object. And, and we've gone around in circles on this one, you know, the confusion. So they, they went out to the, you know, there's a small community of 30 or 40 of us worldwide that really are interested and concerned about object role modeling. And uh, we took a vote, and the consensus was we better keep calling it object role modeling, even though ORM means something to other people. Pass the mic back. <laughs> well, you wouldn't necessarily hear about that because back in the 80s, the University of Minnesota dropped their library science program. If you want library science, you go down to the University of uh, Iowa. Library science is everything that the librarian needs to know about in doing their job. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, e electronics, a lot of systems involved in that whole thing. So it's all of your indexing and your cataloging systems and your searching abilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very much like what we do in information systems. But they think they've got a hold on the world of all the information that libraries keep, right? <laughs> well, obviously, that whole field is being turned upside down. That's what library science is. And there's a, uh, there's a National Association of Librarians, um, and there are, or, or, there are whole professional societies now devoted to library science and publications. OK, so what do we call it? Well, we're going to continue to call it an object. So when I think about an entity, where are the attributes? Where are the attributes? A lot of this is going to be review for you. The attributes are inside the entity. They're inside that box. I could even draw them be outside the box, but we, but we think of them as being tightly coupled, if you like, to, the, to that thing called the entity. And we'll designate one or some combination of them as the identifier. So we have identifiers, we have attributes, and the identifier is just a special attribute. Um, in object role modeling, we have the object, that's the entity, but we think separately of other objects. And because there's a connection, they can become descriptors, and be thought of as descriptors or attributes. So objects or entities have attributes, descriptors, by playing roles in relationships with other entities. I keep repeating that, right? <laughs> So, what does this record really represent? What does this record really represent? Could I do this to it? Could I take the information in that A, X, A, B, C and break it out into X, A, X, B, and X, C? Basically, three little tables. Is that the same thing? It is. It's the same thing. No more, no less. What is each one of those things? What is XA, really? I, if I said to you, if I just had X, could I have a thing here called X? Just X, little table. Yeah, that's very meaningful. That's the population of X. And it's going to contain values underneath it, one column, that is the population of x. So when I put x and a together, what is that? It's a relationship. It's not an entity at all. If I design minimal records with at most one non-key domain, then that's a remedy for all of the questions or violations of, of normalization, because we have fully decomposed. And the solution to a normalization problem is always the same, decomposition. So let's, let's go right to the extreme. 
of record decomposition. That means, at most, one non-key domain um, in any given little record. But we don't want to call this a record anymore, you see? Because record is something where you've clustered stuff. Okay? The ultimate end of record decomposition. Now what do these represent? They represent relationships. And what did Ted Codd call this XABC? That was one of the questions on the quiz. What did Ted Codd call this? Well, it's a tuple, but that's not the term he used. A collection of tuples is what? A relation is what he called it. Not a relationship, a relation. Now, if it's nothing but a bunch of relationships mashed together as it is, then maybe he was right. And I'm, unfortunately, I didn't think about asking him this question before he died, <laughs> or I would have had a discussion about this. But maybe he was right in naming it a relation, a collection of relationships. Now, that's a whole different perspective than saying that entity is X, because it's not just X. This, this avoids spurious associations of A to B. Could there be any violations of the normal forms? Question on the quiz, and the answer is no. Not when it's simple like that. What about representing the entity X? If I had X and A, X, B, X, C to get separately, how do I find the population of X? I got to take the union of all three of those, don't I? It's nothing to say that every X is going to be in the one with A, B, and C. Because if there's an X with no A, why would I even store it? That says there's no relationship between X and A if there's an X without an A. So it's not going to be there. The only reason why it ends up being there and you say it's optional is because you put them together, A, B, C. What if A is related to other entities? In, 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 the, in the top case, you create another table of X. I mean, table of A, right? Can't connect it from X. So, what are we assuming in a relational database when we see this table called an entity name? What do we have to assume? We assume that there's attributes are inside of it and that there's a functional dependency between all of those and X, and only that. A is dependent upon X, okay? And it's a function. There can be at most one value of A for each X. So we're not going to do that because that's only representing the relationships. This is what we do. We start by putting down the objects that we have. We don't have to distinguish what's an attribute because I haven't even talked about relationships. I've just talked about the things in my world that I want to represent. I want to represent a population of X's, of A's, of B's, and of C's. Step number one. Step number two is, what are the relationships among those? Well, there's a relationship between X and A. That's why I put A in the table of X, and XB and XC. Is there any relationship between A and B? Not in the table of X. Okay. Uh, I repeat. <laughs> okay. So let me... Now I'm going to start to have you do object role modeling. Given two facts. <clears throat> One fact about a city 
that a person lives in, another fact about a city that a person works in. And let's assume that every person has to live and work in some city, that every person can live and work in only one city, at least at a time. Um, if you were interested in, in it being overtime, now we're talking about building a history or a historical database, and that's a different kind of question. Usually a database is a snapshot of things at a point in time. And we're not interested in anything else, anything more about persons or cities. So an example here might be Gordon Everest lives in Roseville and works in Minneapolis. Well, I work in, I live in Minneapolis too because I moved there last year. Um, what would the data model look like if I were doing it in an entity relationship model or a relational model? What would be the identifier? This is for you to work at. Yeah, I think it would be person, right? And what would be the attributes associated with this? We're going to build a table now around person. Person is going to be the identifier. Okay. What uh, what will be the attributes? Okay, can I just say city? See, there's a role that a city plays. And in this case, a city plays two roles with respect to person, right? Where they live and where they work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to include two columns, aren't I? One for the city that they live in, one for the city that they work in. Okay. What's the entity and what's the attribute here? Well, it sounds like person's the entity and it sounds like city's the attribute. Would it make sense to say that city is an attribute of person? Yeah. But is city a thing or is city just an attribute? No, city's a thing on all by itself. We're doing more than is necessary when we sort of lock yourself in to thinking person, and city is an attribute of person. But that's what we're doing. <clears throat> Notice we can't have city and city as an attribute. We have to complement that with a role name. So it's entity plus a role. City, the fact of city, is lost. I don't have a table of city. Are cities real things that we could be talking about? Yeah. And the only reason why I don't have a table of cities here is because A, there's no orphans that I'm interested in, and B, there's no additional information that I'm collecting about cities. Therefore, I don't need a table of cities. But it's still no less of a thing, an object, that we could be talking about. <clears throat> OK. So, here's how we would do it in object role modeling. We have a person, we have a city. We have a relationship between the two. So a person lives in a city, another relationship is a person works in a city. It's as simple as that. And notice how I can read. If my, if my objects are singular nouns and my predicates or my relationships are singular verbs, then I can say person lives in a city, and person works in city. And those are two different relationships. And when I say every person lives in some city, I'll just say person has to participate in the relationship with city. That's what the dot means. It means that that person, every person, has to participate in a relationship with the city. That means city is mandatory for them, at least the city that they live in. And similarly for Workson, <clears throat> when you say each person lives in at most one city, I just don't put a fork there. Okay? So if a person lives in at most one city, that means, remember my bucket example? Question here. Yeah. 
So would, uh, if a person lived in the same city that they worked in, would there be any distinction between the two or would, nope. would it just remain as the same thing, I guess? In a what is a relationship? A relationship is a collection of, if it's binary, a collection of value pairs. One taken from one population, the other taken from the other population. That's all it is. Okay, and there's nothing to say that person and city in the table for the relationship lives in couldn't have the same match as person and city in the works in table or the works in relationship. And so the city entity is just a pool of attributes that can be taken? No, the, the city here is a pool of cities. Well, yeah, when I, yeah, that's what I meant. But it can be taken, but like... Could you add in something else that would qualify as unique that would be taking something from a city and then it would just be, there would, you'd show a relationship into that in the same way you are with a person? If there's, is this between city and person you're talking about? No, I'm saying if there's an additional thing like... Uh, Do they ride a bicycle? <laughs> no, uh, I don't know why I can't think of anything, but... <laughs> Like also, maybe they go to school. Okay. Maybe the city in which they go to school. Yeah. Well, how would I handle that? What, did you just add another connector that said yes, goes to school? Yes, just and... add another connector. How did I think about that other connector? It says, person goes to school in city. Just another relationship. Yeah. John. So when you're talking about the city, um, are you necessarily talking about the city name? Or where, like, where does the identifier fit into the city? So like, if you say the city is the city and the state, or if the city is like, you know, something that you're controlling? Good question. And I, I probably, in this example, should have left off ID and city. Because that distracted you already. We model first in terms of populations of things. At some point, we're going to ask ourselves, what are we going to use for the surrogate to identify cities? But that's a whole separate question. Okay? Our modeling is done in terms of the things themselves. So we don't get hung up in what's the identifier. I like that. I'm going to take it off of there. This is how slides get revised. <laughs> okay. Um, so, we said for this, uh, every person uh, lives in at most one city. That means that a person participates in this relationship with city only once. And that little, t if you think of that thing in the middle as a little table, because that's what a relationship is, it's a pair, it's a, a set of pairs, then it means that person can be in there only once. That's why we draw a line across that part of the predicate or of the, uh, of the uh, relationship because that is the unique identifier. Yeah. Can you describe one situation when the relationship is not unique? What does it mean for a relationship to be unique? For example, like, so, like above lives in and walks in, you have a double-headed arrow. So, is that required for every relationship you put in between two oh. entities? Yeah. So, is it required for every relationship? 
every relationship has cardinality at each end, either none or one or many. Okay, and we, we divide those up into talking about multiplicity and versus exclusivity and dependency and optionality. Okay, and that alone is what's going to determine where that line is. Okay. It could be over one or the other or both, but it won't be neither. Can't be neither. What would that mean? What I want you to notice is that we use the term exhaustibility, okay? Um, or we, we use the term, um, if we have a bucket of persons, the dot says that the person must, at the, at the end of building that relationship, every person has to have been picked at least once, Right? That's what we said about, uh, and, and that's the, uh, the uh, dependency part or the exhaustibility part. And we then also are saying the person can only be drawn once. So the person is drawn out of the person bucket without replacement. That means it's at most one. Okay? So person lives in some city, must, that's the mandatory uh, constraint, and each person lives in at most one city. That's what we call the uniqueness constraint. That's what it's called. Okay? And we do the same thing exactly for works in. Okay? Question? Ethan? Sure. Uh, just on the relationship boxes, why do you have like two individual boxes and the right one is empty? Well, how do we name a relationship? Here we've named it in one direction. Person lives in city. Okay, could I name it in the other direction? If I wanted to use a sentence and city was going to be the subject, what would I say? Like has, or live, a city has people? Uh, a city houses person. Okay. Every binary relationship, going back to H1, every binary relationship is inherently bidirectional. If person is related to city because they live in it, then by George, city is related to person. I may or may not name them, but I could, and that other box is to provide an, a, a place to put the name in the other direction. And in ORM, you, you can leave one blank or not, but you have to have a reading. Okay? So, uh, let's suppose we add the fact that a person makes sales calls in multiple cities. Oh. Let's finish this example. A person makes sales calls in multiple cities. Okay? Does anything have to change in the diagram that we had before? Or can we just add to it? What are you going to do? We now have another relationship between persons and cities. What are you going to do? It's as simple as that. Just draw another line between the two of them. There is another relationship. So put an arc for that relationship. Okay? Now, what's going to be, what's that relationship going to look like? A person can make sales calls in multiple cities. You always have to ask the question in the other direction. And I saw you say one to many. How many persons could have, how many, how many persons could be making a sales call in the same city? M multiple, right? So what's the nature of this relationship? It's many to many. And so what am I going to do in my diagram? 
I just add a fork at each end and say it's many to many, so I'm going to have the two of them as a composite identifier. Okay? What does this semantic do if I'm building a relational database? The first two were easy. I put city in that they live in as one attribute and city they work in as another attribute. Can I do that now? I cannot. There's a many-to-many -many relationship. Can it be reflected in XAB? It can't. So what do I do? I'm going to have to have another table around that's got a composite key in it to reflect the relationship between persons and cities in the relationship makes sales calls in. Okay. What's the real entity in this conceptual view? Is there an entity associated with this third table that I had to introduce? Sometimes there is, but more often there's not. But in a relational model, because of the underlying problem, you can't represent multiple, you know, multi-valued attributes, multi, multiple um, valued foreign keys, you have to, okay, break it out into a separate table. Okay, so I think you've already done that. All right, so we'll break there. We didn't get too far, but that's okay. Um, right, have a good spring break. Anybody going away somewhere? You are going to stay and work, work hard on this course, right? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.